Hello and welcome to the Arts in Conversation. I'm Ben Hartley, Executive Director of the National Arts Club, located here in New York City. For those not familiar with the club, we're a 501c3 nonprofit with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. At the National Arts Club, we celebrate all art forms. So for this podcast series, each episode dives deeper into one specific medium. Today, our episode is dedicated to fashion. For years, our club has hosted lectures and conversations on a wide range of fashion topics. We've looked at everything from the history of 18th century dress, to the revival of Western wear, to the somewhat taboo topic of latex. These programs, often some of the most well attended at the club, bring a stylish and diverse crowd to the club with many attendees dressing up to meet the theme. Fashion and style have always been a way to say who you are without having to speak. Are you a stylish and sophisticated person in Prada, a sporty person in Nike, or a preppy person in Ralph Lauren? All of these clothes communicate before you say a word. To introduce our topic a bit further, we head to a recent evening at the club celebrating fashion historian Dr. Valerie Steele. Dr. Steele is the director and chief curator of the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. A leading expert in her field, she has personally organized more than 25 exhibitions and authored dozens of books. Joining us to celebrate Dr. Steele were some of the top names in fashion, including recent Medal of Honor honorees Anna Sui and Narcissa Rodriguez, as well as Ralph Rucci, style icon Daphne Guinness, and editor and writer Robin Gavan. We hear from some of them now. Uh, I'm Valerie Steele. I'm director and chief curator of the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology, and I'm editor in chief and founder of Fashion Theory. Fashion is a part of culture which is very much related to individual human identity. The moment that I discovered that I would work on fashion for my life career, my friend uh, Judy Coffin spoke about two articles from the feminist journal Signs debating whether the corset had been oppressive to women or liberating. And it was like a light bulb went on and I realized fashion's part of culture, I can do fashion history. And from that minute, that's all I did. I'm Robin Gavon and I'm the senior critic at large for the Washington Post. Fashion, it's been an industry that I've covered for a long time. And I think in that regard, it's been um, a rich repository for to think about culture and politics and gender and power and all the other things that um, make our society tick. Um, I'm Vanessa Friedman. I'm the fashion director of the New York Times. Fashion is an expression of political, cultural, and social identity at a specific moment in time. I'm just really interested in expressions of identity and how people communicate that to the outside world. And to me, that's what clothing is about. Hello, I'm Anna Sui, and I'm a fashion designer. I think when people think of Anna Sui fashion, they think of fun, they think of vintage, uh, very feminine, and a little touch of rock and roll. Um, That's what I'm all about. You know, that's, it comes from the heart, and um, I think that I've always stayed true to my guns, and that's really what my collections have always been. Thanks so much to all of our guests. It's often said that shoes make the outfit. On that note, we start this episode with Elizabeth Semelhack. Elizabeth is a director and senior curator of the Barter Shoe Museum. Her work focuses on the intersections of fashion, culture, and economics in relation to footwear. Located in Toronto, Canada, the Barter Shoe Museum regularly displays over a thousand shoes and related artifacts, chosen from a collection of over 14,000 objects in architect Raymond Moriyama's iconic award-winning building. Here to share her insight, let's welcome Elizabeth now. My name is Elizabeth Semelhack. I have had this job for close to 22 years. And when I began, I had no idea how long I'd be able to ask questions about shoes. And now I know for a fact, I will never be able to ask all the questions I have. 
So the museum was founded by Mrs. Sonia Bada when she first married Mr. Bada. Um, she liked to say that she married a shoe man. She began to travel with her husband and she made a very astute observation. People's feet are basically the same no matter where you go in the world, but what people have historically put on their feet has been incredibly different. She started collecting with more seriousness and she really began to do a deep dive into historical footwear. And somewhere along the way, um, she was told that maybe her collection was interesting enough that she could, should consider making a museum. She started the foundation in 1979, and then we opened our doors in 1995. The idea was to be a research center um, that was focused on the history of footwear and really trying to look at history and culture starting at the footwear level. I think the term fashion is itself a somewhat confusing term. I think a lot of people, when they think of fashion, um, erroneously think that fashion is something that's Western. Fashion is something that is global. And so I would argue that footwear has consistently been a part of fashion since shoes were made. And What's really interesting about looking at the history of shoes is that you might think that shoes just have a very basic job to do. They're, they're meant to be comfortable and they're meant to get you from point A to point B, protect your foot. But the history of shoes, and in fact, probably what's even in your own wardrobes, shows that we actually use shoes to signal cultural things. And very often, especially in women's footwear, comfort is of secondary importance. <laughs> and so um, the use of shoes to signal gender, to signal social standing, this is a global uh, and eons old phenomena. So I would argue that shoes have been central to fashion and that fashion has been central to human expression since time immemorial. I have quite a few places where there are these naughty questions that I'm really trying to unlace. Um, so one of them is, I've worked on the history of the high heel. My first question when I got to the museum was a very innocent question that I thought many people would have answered, which was, what, why the high heel? And I found out that no serious work had actually been done on the history of the high heel. And so I've been able to trace it back so far as to 10th century Persia, I believe it predates that. Um, it is Western Asian, just someplace in there. Uh, and I've been able to trace how it entered into Western fashion, was embraced by men, then became a signifier of femininity. So I still would like to more fully understand how the concept of the heel enters into Western culture. That's something I'd love to have a smoking gun about. But simultaneous to my work on heels in the early 17th century, I've also worked on the Chopin, which is another incredible form of platform shoe that was worn in Southern Europe that has its links back into antiquity. And so you have these two forms of elevating shoes, the, the very high platforms worn by women in Southern Europe, and then you have the heel coming in through Northern Europe, um, first worn by men. And I, I'm interested in this moment when the heel becomes fashionable and the Chopin is removed from fashion. And the most frustrating thing about all of it is that these are, in my mind, of course, wildly important shifts in footwear um, and footwear meaning, and yet very few people ever write about it at the time. And so I need more time to look at funerary sculptures, to look at paintings and prints and popular culture items to really try to nail down exactly what's happening in that century. But I'm also very interested in sneakers. I've done a lot with sneaker culture. Uh, and the meaning of sneakers, uh, the newest exhibition that opens just uh, in a few weeks on May 26th is called Future Now, and it looks at innovation today and where we're going, including um, the importance of footwear in the metaverse. The metaverse is a umbrella term for places where you can go into as an avatar, where you watch your avatar move around a space. So it could be in an online game, it can be in a 
a, a space that you just have on your computer, but it can also be a virtual reality space where you're wearing a virtual reality headset and you're stepping into and very convincingly feel like you are in another place. Sometimes shoes in the metaverse can look like shoes in real life. You know, if you think about the Jordan collaboration with Fortnite, where players could earn skins that included Air Jordan 1s. Um, and so that's, a, I guess, a very good example of a kind of blurring between real life and the virtual realm. So in addition, in the exhibition, we have some footwear made specifically for wear in the virtual world. And what's interesting to me about the possibilities of footwear in the metaverse is that the physical body isn't real. And so you don't have to even think about comfort, fit. You can do anything in the design of footwear in, in the metaverse. And what I'm hoping to see as this grows is that people begin to not replicate what we have in the real world, challenge what we have in the real world. And I think that this is really going to be an interesting space um, for fashion design. Things that we're told is that fashion is a form of self-expression. However, the fashions that we buy are in general pre-made. Even if you go to a vintage shop, those vintage shoes have been selected. They've either been saved for some reason, social reason, they've been winnowed out for some larger social reasons. And I think that one of the main reasons that we wear fashion is to signal alliances. For example, Birkenstocks, until very recently, um, used to be a form of footwear that when you saw somebody in them, you might feel comfortable, you might be wrong, but you might feel comfortable assuming that they had liberal politics, they might have a vegetarian diet, they um, had certain, um, they had certain leanings, certain, certain leftist leanings. And that could all be embodied in just their choice of footwear. So the same can be said about which brand of sneakers that you might wear. Different sneaker brands convey different ideas. And so people choose these things, whether they do it consciously or subconsciously, that then get incorporated into how they are creating their own sense of self-presentation. There are some things that we find naturalized on some bodies. The high heel today is a perfect example of that. We don't even notice it on some bodies, or we celebrate it on some bodies, like, wow, you look fantastic today. And yet on other bodies, we can be instantly shocked, like stop traffic shocked by seeing somebody wearing nothing different from their normal expected uniform than a change of shoes. So I think there's an incredible amount of um, naturalized meaning in shoes that we actually all play with when we decide what to buy and what to wear to an occasion or to work. It's in those moments of, oh, I shouldn't probably wear that pair of shoes to this event, or I should wear this to a job interview that I'm very interested in unpacking. Thanks so much to Elizabeth. Next, we'd like to introduce you to Raven Ong. Raven is a Filipino-born costume designer and professor based right outside of New York City in Connecticut. Having moved to the United States in 2014, he continues his work on productions in the Philippines while also working locally in New York and across the country. Raven has created costumes for performances of the Philippine premieres of Kinky Boots, Matilda, Waitress and Beautiful, the Carol King musical. He was nominated for Outstanding Costume Design for Peter Pan, A Musical Adventure, Jekyll and Hyde, Alice in Wonderland, and Rapunzel, Rapunzel, A Very Hairy Fairy Tale. Listen in as he shares his unique international experience working in costume design. My name is Raven Ong. I am a professional costume designer. I am also an educator. I am an assistant professor of costume design here at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, Connecticut. I uh, collaborate a lot with directors, I buy fabrics, I build costumes, so anything that uh, has to do with what actors are going to be wearing on stage is my job. 
I moved to the United States in 2014, and I've been uh, designing uh, costumes for mainstream theater companies in the Philippines for about seven years before I decided to pursue you know, further studies. When theater design was introduced to me, that's how I would say my life transformed because I can see designing from paper being translated into something that's really tangible. Uh, you know, I got to design props and set designs and costumes and all of that. I actually get uh, asked often about what shows do we do in the Philippines, but we actually do a lot of things that are similar. We do Shakespeare a lot. We do Oscar Wilde a lot. Uh, so basically the shows that we do here in the United States are the same things and the same productions that we do there. Uh, we have adaptations into Tagalog or in our language uh, of Shakespeare and Arthur Miller. But one thing that I would say that might be a little bit different is that Filipinos really love color. I guess it really is all about the culture and what's more appealing to the to the eyes of the Filipinos. And um, I particularly love designing for fantasy and children's theaters because you know that's when I can really go full on with the use of bright colors, saturated colors, um, without anything really completely being wrong. You know, in that sense. I really wanted to know what the show is about first. Uh, what is the show? Is it a play? Is it a musical? Is it a tragedy? Is it a melodrama? Is it an opera? Uh, so things like that. And to me, as a designer, I always wanted to figure out my emotional response uh, to things. I mean, after reading a script, for example, did it make you laugh? Did it make you angry? You know, things like that. Because I think um, one of the the best things that we as human beings are capable of of, of doing or experiencing uh, would be having a reaction to things, you know, a response to something. And so to me as a designer, it's always good to really trust your instinct. I always trusted, um, you know, how I felt about the material. What is the message of the material? What is the author or the playwright trying to say, you know, with, with the dialogues and the, or the use of words? And so I really wanted to, to respond first, you know, how do I feel about a certain thing? I also want to think about color. Um, like what I mentioned earlier, if it's a tragedy, if it's um, comedy, if it's a farce, I want to start thinking about the color because when you think about color, then that sets not just the tone, but the sense of environment uh, of, of the play and the material. When we talk about like costume design, when we mention costume, sometimes people tend to think that, you know, it's Halloween or a costume, you know, um, but we always forget that costume is actually clothing. That uh, alone connects it to, to fashion. And I mean, if you even look at runways uh, nowadays, not everything is wearable. Who's going to wear this? Uh, what occasions do you wear this uh, collection? But when we talk about costume, we really delve you know, more into understanding what the characters are about, because it's always the portrayal of these characters, like real life people uh, on stage in real life situations. Fashion is always an inspiration for us, costume designers as well. I mean, it always serves as a visual reference for us. The questions about like what is in style, you know, what what is trendy, who are the designers now, and how do their collections look? Fashion runways are always a good source for us too. <laughs> uh, it might not be all avant garde, you know, it might not always be haute couture, but uh, you know, the lines, the shapes, the silhouettes are always what we uh, find very interesting and where we can draw inspirations from. Uh, if I may share one experience when I was in grad school, I was uh, designing King Lear uh, by Shakespeare back then. And as we know, in Shakespeare plays, there's always, you know, a multitude of <laughs> of characters. And so, you know, I remember my experience being so overwhelmed with like, how do I even start with, you know, designing for King Lear, you know, and dozens and dozens and dozens of, of characters. And so I remember my mentor telling me, Raven, when you're designing for a play like this with lots of characters, start thinking of clothing as a fashion collection. Perhaps, you know, it's about the length of the tunics. Perhaps it's the length or, you know, the volume of or the shaping that might just like be a little bit different from, from the worlds within the same world of King Lear. 
I'm concentrating and more focused on my shows this coming summer. Uh, I have a show called The Ecstasy of Victoria Woodhall, which will be part of the Hollywood Fringe in, in LA. Uh, so this is about Victoria Woodhall, uh, who is the f first woman who actually ran for president here in the United States. And I am currently designing and building an 1880s uh, outfit for my actor, Ashley Ford. And I'm actually set to travel to Hollywood by the end of the month and be there for the opening night. I have like three plays uh, with the same theater company that I'm designing right now, uh, which will be in New York. Since I'm sharing my story, I think I like how the universe really, you know, designed my path because I wouldn't have discovered theater if I didn't figure that um, I just wasn't contented with everything drawn in paper. I honestly could not imagine myself doing something else. Uh, and even where I grew up in the Philippines, you'd find this very interesting. Uh, my parents are vegetable dealers and just like two blocks from where we lived and where they uh, established their business are the fabric stores. So I grew up walking around the area, seeing fabrics, you know, and my grandmother loved ballroom dancing. And so she always had some, you know, dance outfits uh, made. That really is just, you know, the universe setting you up, you know, for what you will become. You know, I've seen how theater alone uh, can provide lots of employment. But I think my wish for right now is to really for the costuming business and the costuming world to keep flourishing, especially right everybody is uh, coming out of you know fresh from from the pandemic. Uh, my wish is that uh, the theater business, the costuming business, the costume shops will keep flourishing and be able to employ more workers. When you get to work in a very professional setting of the costume shop that builds, uh, costumes for Broadway shows and professional productions, you'd find it so impressive and amazing to think that there are these people who actually spend their life, um, you know, performing their uh, expertise in costume construction. I would also add and wish for pay equity for everybody as well and more, more diversity in, in the workplace. Uh, I would wish for um, more designers of color in the field, embracing uh, what the world means now in 2022, uh, more doors for people, immigrants like me, uh, to be able to share my, my craft uh, as well and my knowledge. And, and I think that once we get to that point, then it would be a lot more spectacular, you know, in the world of costuming. And, and it is really nice that we're talking about uh, fashion and culture and costumes, because this always goes back to who we are. And with my Filipiniana clothing knowledge uh, as well, uh, I have received countless of uh, messages and emails from Filipino Americans, Filipino Canadians, and it is really through fashion that they can go back to their roots and understand their roots uh, as well, because they only just like see their grandparents and photos and what they wear. And so I think for the most part, clothing really where we can express our cultures, our identities. Thank you, Raven. To be honest, I come to dressing up for Halloween late. It just wasn't a thing in Australia or London where I spent my childhood. However, since I've had children, Halloween has always been fun. The power to invest in make-believe through costumes is transformative. Yet if you watch children play, they're always transitioning from the real to the imaginary. It's that same power of transitioning from the real to the imaginary that adults do when they go to fancy dress, Halloween, participatory events allowing us to escape from who we are to who we are scared of or who we dream of being at some point in the future. As is tradition, we end this episode by introducing you to our National Arts Club members. This time, we have not one, but two always fashionable members we'd like you to meet. First up, Nina Urban. Nina Urban has been involved in the club's fashion programming 
for several years and has helped to plan numerous events, including our annual Bonnet Bash, a celebration of all things headwear. A psychiatrist in her professional life, Nina spends much of her free time exploring her passion for costumes, a hobby she tells us about now. Welcome, Nina. My name is Nina Urban. I am very pleased that I was able to become a member of the National Arts Club. I'm a member of the Fashion Committee since 2013. I came to fashion through costumes and I came to costumes through theater. I was playing theater in high school and um, early on realized the transformative power of costumes for being a different character. Also, I'm from Germany where we have carnival culture that actually uh, goes for a whole season from November to February. So costumes are widely accepted. Carnival is related to Catholic Church. Originally, Catholic regions in the world celebrated uh, as part of the church calendar leading up to the fasting season. So Carnival meaning let go of meat, the season of introspection, repenting, fasting, being more uh, of a modest lifestyle. I'm not Catholic, so I like the costumes, but uh, I grew up in a very mixed region. Catholic, Protestant carnival season was in full swing and the events start in November and then culminating in what you know as Mardi Gras. So costumes, you know, what's the difference between costuming and fashion? Costume usually defines that you are indeed another character, but I found that fashion dressing up glamorously for special occasions is also transformative because it can be for, you know, a naturally shy person like me, it really helps to step into a different character. Uh, my favorite subject <laughs> is Bonnet Bash is the annual celebration of all things headwear uh, hosted by the Fashion Committee uh, since its inception in 2013. The idea came from David Seiler, the current or co-chair of the Fashion Committee. Bonnet Bash, it's not only bonnets we wear. In fact, um, <laughs> we wear very different things. The focus is an exhibition, one night only installation of headwear. Um, by featured designers, um, but it has evolved into a full-fledged party that I think um, is generally quite popular. <laughs> so we actually do give out um, prizes, usually three prizes. This year's winners were a three-course meal, a lady who actually fabricated um, a headpiece with a lobster dinner. I think it was a, a salad platter and dessert platter on her head, be sparkled, be dazzled, good enough to eat. <laughs> and her partner was wearing a headdress that was essentially a s'mores dinner, you know, with marshmallows. And um, I think you can even light it on fire, although we didn't do that here. <laughs> and I think the most opulent prize was just a very beautiful uh, floral arrangement. So, so those were great, but um, I think everyone was a winner. Everyone really, really tried their best. Fashion is not only, you know, beautiful, glamorous clothes, but really um, a style, which is, you know, a personal style. So um, I spoke about costumes, which makes it easy to transform into a different character. But I think out of the ordinary is important because we all lead ordinary lives. Fashion allows to step out of that and into something that is immediately enjoyable um, and uplifting. So I see a very therapeutic aspect of fashion. It can really help to transform and be a different person. Are you more yourself in your, you know, normal clothes or uh, when you dress up? Dress up and life will provide the occasion. <laughs> Thanks so much to Nina. And finally, we go back to our celebration of Dr. Steele, this time to hear from National Arts Club member David Zeiler. David, a current co-chair of the club's fashion committee, is an Emmy award-winning stylist and best-selling author. Having spent many years working in film, television and Broadway, he recently received his eighth Emmy nomination for costume design for his work on CBS's The Young and the Restless. David, take it away. I think anyone who is fortunate enough to be paid to be creative is so lucky and I feel that I am very lucky um, you know I started uh, when I was very young I always had an interest in fashion and color and so on and 
you know, growing up in upstate New York, you never really, I never knew exactly how or where I would make a career out of that. Uh, but it was really after I went to NYU in my second year where I thought, I don't, I started as an acting student and I thought, I love this, but I'm not, I don't think it's forever. I don't think this is me. And I started to take design classes and it just created this urge to, to do it. And, uh, and then I studied further a lot of uh, classes on color and art history and so on. And so I wrote a book on color and a book on shopping. And, and I've been doing uh, TV shows in Broadway and off-Broadway for 30 years. Whenever I lecture or speak to young people, like lecture at universities and things like that, or a young person asks me advice, I always say that it is very important to pass it along. And, you know, I, I'd love to say that my mentor was, insert famous name here, but I have to tell you the biggest influence was probably my family. Uh, my grandfather was a part-time artist, a brilliant, brilliant artist who was asked to, uh, to uh, be a sketch artist for Walt Disney and uh, turned it down because he, his young bride said, we're not moving from Utica, New York, to Cal this place called California. Um, so I would sit and draw with him. And my aunt was an amateur artist. And my parents loved theater. And so the exposure I had was amazing, you know, to, um, to understand that, you know, creativity was a really good thing. Thank you, David, and thank you all for listening to this episode of The Arts in Conversation. Future episodes will be released on the 15th of each month, so be sure to subscribe and listen next month. The Arts in Conversation is produced by Emily Charish from Charish Sound. Charish Sound produces branded podcasts for businesses. The Arts in Conversation is also produced by Mitch Case from the National Arts Club. We look forward to having you with us again next month.